So welcome to part five of a conceptual introduction to item response theory. In this section, I'm going to be talking about IRT information. You know about the concept of reliability and measurement. Reliability has to do with the reproducibility of a measure. So with this ruler, if you're measuring a goldfish, and sometimes it's five inches, and then other times it's 3.5 inches, it's not a very good measure. I don't know why I chose a goldfish as a metaphor here, except that it's kind of pretty. Think of the goldfish as a metaphor for any outcome you want to measure. The fish could be called pain or depression or shoulder function, or it could be called Matilda for that matter. Just as we can evaluate the reliability of measurements of things we can, that we can see, you know, such as the length of a goldfish, we also can estimate the reliability of scales that measure things that we can't see, things like pain, fatigue, positive affect, the quantities that we call latent constructs. So a typical way of doing this is to calculate the standard error of measurement. Suppose you were to take repeated measurements of some quantity. Even with a pretty good ruler, you wouldn't expect to get the same score every time because inherently there's some error whenever you make a measurement. What you would get is a range of scores with repeated administration of a scale. Now, if your scale, if your scale is reliable, the range of scores that you get will be quite small. So the standard deviation of these scores will also be small, and we call that standard deviation the standard error of measurement. Here you see the formula that is used in classical test theory to calculate the standard error of measurement. As this formula indicates, the standard error is the standard deviation of scores, a sample of scores called x, multiplied by the square root of 1 minus reliability, the reliability of whatever scale we're talking about. So let's take this formula apart. The standard deviation referred to, the standard deviation subscript x, is the standard deviation of scores in sample x, now, this is not the same standard deviation that I described in the previous slide. Um, that's, that standard deviation is the standard error of measurement. And the standard error of measurement is a standard deviation, but it's the standard deviation of the distribution of scores you would get after measuring the very same person over and over again. This is a standard deviation of a sample. If you're measuring the, the pain of a sample that included people with chronic pain and people who never had any pain, then the standard deviation subscript x here would be quite large because the variability in scores in your sample is quite large. Now notice the part under the square root sign, the 1 minus reliability. This reliability refers to the reliability of whatever scale it is that you're using. And ideally the reliability estimate that you would plug in here would be based on a test-retest correlation, but it also might be based on something else such as the, uh, an estimate of the homogeneity of the items. You probably know that a reliability for a scale of 0 0.90 is pretty good. A reliability of 0.3 is pretty bad, and that perfect reliability is 1.0. So for fun, let's just plug in a reliability of 1 into this equation and see what happens. Under the square root sign, we'd have 1 minus 1, and that equals 0. So then we'd take the square root of 0, and that's 0. Now we would multiply 0 times the standard deviation of scores in the sample, and once again, you get 0. See, this math's not hard at all. So what is your standard error? The standard error would also be 0. Thus, it's saying that if you were to have perfect reliability, then your standard error would be 0. That is, if you measure the same person over and over, you would get the same score each time, no variability. But what if your scale had no reliability, literally zero reliability? Let's plug a reliability estimate of zero into this equation. Um, under the square root sign, we'd have 1 minus 0, which equals 1. The square root of 1 is 1. Well, multiply 1 times the standard deviation of scores in the sample, and you get, no surprise, the standard deviation. So what is your standard error? The standard error in this scenario is the same value as the standard deviation of the scores in the sample. Thus, for any given person, getting their score on the scale tells you absolutely nothing about a person's trait level. You get as much variance when you measure a single person over and over as you do when you measure the entire sample. Item response theory takes a really different approach to, re to reliability than that taken in classical test theory. The analogous concept to reliability in IRT is called information. Information in IRT, by the way, is cumulative, and what I mean by that is 
uh, when information is calculated in IRT, every response category has some information. And if you sum across all the category information functions for a single item, then you get that item's information. If you sum across all the item information, you get the scale information. And of course, as the name implies, more information implies more reliability. More reliability means less error in measurement. You can express item response theory information in terms of standard error. Here you see the classical test theory formula compared to the IRT formula for standard error. Notice that there are two big differences. First, the standard deviation of the sample is not included in the IRT formula. Calculation of information and standard error of measurement in item response theory is not dependent upon the sample. Second, you'll notice that theta has slipped into the IRT formula. Recall that theta stands for whatever it is you are measuring. If you're measuring pain interference, theta is a given level of pain interference. In the classical test theory formula for standard error, level of trait is not considered. If you ask a researcher what the reliability of the BPI interference subscale is, she might say, well, it ranges from X to Y depending on the study and the sample. What she doesn't say is that it depends on level of the trait being measured. So a reliability estimate calculated using classical test theory is a single estimate. In a sense, it's the reliability of a scale averaged over all levels of the trait being measured. The single estimate obscures the fact that a scale typically measures some levels of trait better than it measures other levels of trait. In the last slide, I showed you how to calculate standard error if you already knew what the IRT information value was. This slide shows you how to calculate information. As I've done in previous parts of this module, I'm going to use the Roche dichotomous model as an example because it's just easier to explain that way. Here we'll think about items that can be answered either yes or no. And there you see the formula for calculating item for information. Information for a given level of theta equals the probability of a no response, again, given theta, multiplied by the probability of an answering yes to an item, and once again, given theta. Remember that information is cumulative in IRT, so if I did this calculation for this item and then all dichotomous items of the Roche calibrated scale and added them up, the sum would be the scale information, or also called the test information, for a given level of theta. If I did it across the entire theta scale, then I'd have what's called a function, not just a point on a plot, but a function, which I'm going to show you more about later. So let's just do some of these calculations by hand. Suppose the probability of saying no was 0.10. That would make the probability of saying yes 0.90. If you multiply those together, you get an information value of 0.09. If the probability was 0.30 for no and 0.7 for yes, then you'd get 0.21 would be 0.21 would be your value for information. If the probabilities were 0.5 and 0.5, this would be the point of what? Go ahead, say it aloud, median probability. And the value of information at this point is 0.25. Then we figure these last two, and they are just like the first two with values of 0.21 and 0.09. Now, take a look at the information values for these examples. The largest, largest information is where? Yep, right there at the point of median probability. And this makes some intuitive sense. Say you're measuring pain with this item, and the item says, pain keeps me from cooking for myself. Yes or no? For people who have pain that makes them 90% likely to say yes to this item, administering this item to them doesn't provide you much information. It doesn't really greatly reduce your uncertainty about where exactly this person is on the pain continuum. But for people who have a 0.5 probability of saying yes and a 0.5 probability of saying no, this item gives you a lot of information because they are on the threshold of a yes and no answer. How they respond helps a lot in discriminating their levels of pain. Again, the example I just gave was for the simplest model, the Roche dichotomous model. As I've mentioned before, some models are more complicated. Some are for items that have more than two responses. That's one way they become more complicated. And also some models not only include an estimate of the item difficulty, but also item discrimination. When discrimination is included in an IRT model, it's also included in the formula for information.
the information calculated calculation is weighted by the discrimination. Thus, items with higher discrimination have higher information. Here you see an example of an information function. What makes it a function and not just a point on the plot? Well, it's that it varies across the measurement continuum, and you need a line to represent that. So you can see on the, this graph that for levels of the trait that are lower, lower levels of theta, there's a lot of information. But for higher levels of theta, there's very little information. This item is more reliable at lower than it, it is at higher levels of trait. Here you see the probability curves that are associated with this item, the, the category characteristic curves. And you can see right away that it's a polytomous item. There are four possible responses to this item. And I know that because there are four curves represented. So maybe the categories for this item are never, rarely, sometimes, and often. Notice that if you start at low levels of the trait and begin to move across the x-axis to higher levels of trait, that the answer that is the most probable changes pretty quickly with small increments of theta. So at the lowest level of theta, the most likely answer to this question is never. But with just a little increment in theta, rarely becomes the most likely response. Then an answer of sometimes becomes the most likely response for a for a range of theta there. And then from about theta equals zero on, the most likely response category that people endorse is often. So people who have a theta of zero or higher are most likely to respond um, often to this item. You remember what happens to information when the probability of one response is very high. The information calculation is very low. And that's exactly what you see in this graph. The greatest information is where the probabilities are changing a lot, or the most likely response category is changing a lot. This item gives you very little information for discriminating among people who have high levels of trait, but a lot of information for discriminating among people at low levels of the trait. Here's another pair of graphs. The one on top shows the probabilities of four response categories, and the one on bottom shows the information function for the same item. Right away you will see several differences in this pair compared to the last pair that I showed you. First, look at how flat the information function is. This item is not giving you much information at any level of trait. Now look at the category characteristic functions, the category trace lines. One thing you'll notice is that there are only two response categories that are ever the most likely responses at some range of theta. So the first category, let's call it never, is the most likely up until about uh, theta equal maybe minus 2.8. And then for theta levels above that, always becomes the most likely response. Those middle two categories are never the most likely response for any level of theta. Another thing to notice is how flat the category trace lines are. Their slopes are low, meaning that they have low discrimination. And you can see this reflected in the very flat information function. Needless to say, this is not such a great item. Which brings me to a bit of a side note. How cool is it that you can see this level of detail about how an item is functioning? Contrast that with classical test theory. This micro level of detail comes in very handy when you're developing a measure and trying to decide which items to include. I want to circle back to a concept I explained earlier. You will recall that in IRT the standard error of measurement can be calculated based on IRT information. You see the formula there at the bottom of this slide. It's 1 over the square root of information. In this graph you see information and standard error plotted together. The blue line is the information and the red dotted line is standard error. Large values for information are associated with small standard errors and vice versa. As information increases, the denominator of this equation gets bigger, and a bigger denominator means that you get a smaller value for standard error. That's it for part five. Uh, you've now gotten a basic conceptual understanding of item response theory, and so now we can talk about the fun stuff, about how it can be applied. You may have suggestions for part five or perhaps some comments about it. Please let me know. I'd like to hear from you.